This video is sponsored by Skillshare, and if you haven't yet heard of them, Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of great inspiring classes. The latest course I'm doing on there is called Photo Editing in Adobe Photoshop Lightroom, A Beginner's Guide by a great teacher named Tabitha Park. I recently picked up a mirrorless camera, mainly to do some video stuff for YouTube, but also to try my hand at amateur photography. And even though it turns out that I am indeed very amateur at photography, discovering and learning Lightroom through this course has been such a joy. As a lot of you know, I've completed so many great Skillshare courses since working with them and there's still plenty that I want to check out. And the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Some games need no introduction, and Shadow of Memories, or Shadow of Destiny if you're in the States, is definitely not one of those games. It's a 2001 cult adventure game with time mechanics and bad voice acting set in a fictional small German town which has been depicted through a very Japanese lens, where you play as a guy who must repeatedly Final Destination style cheat his own death by travelling through time while being tormented by a demonic character voiced by the guy who voices Mario. It's pretty unusual and it's hard not to have your interest piqued, not just by its premise, but also by its idiosyncrasies. Uh, please, don't shove that near me. I, I don't like the symbol on the cover. The way townsfolk are off-puttingly framed right in the middle of shots when you talk to them, the attention to detail in all the interior locations, the odd low camera angle and bad walking animation, the pixely game engine in desperate need of mip mapping, the unnatural timing of all the dialogue, the way our long-legged protagonist named Ike Kush doesn't seem too phased by anything that's ever happening while still being extremely earnest about it all. Uh, he dies in the opening cutscene of the game, which is a bold way to open a game by the way, and when he gets sent to a purgatory-like area and talks to demon Mario, he's just so amusingly casual about it all. It's it's all very goofy. Can't you trust me? Trust me. Of course not. I get it. You're the big S, the devil. In exchange for your immortal soul and all that, am I right? Beneath all the goofiness though, I was really surprised by just how much I treasured playing Shadow of Memories, especially as I spent more time with it. Uh, at first, it's hard to see this as anything more than a janky, weird relic of the early PlayStation 2 era, but in the layers below the superficial, it reveals itself as a truly compelling and well-written game, and one that you really need to sink your teeth into before any of that becomes clear. The way it all works is, the game is split up into eight different chapters, and you die at the start of almost every one. You'll be brought back to life by Demon Mario, usually around an hour before you die, and you'll need to use that hour, which mostly ticks by in real time, to travel through time and walk around town while wrestling with bad camera controls to stop yourself from getting killed. So, for example, in one chapter you get stabbed by someone hiding behind a tree, and the solution is to, within a time limit, go all the way back to the 1500s when that tree was planted and convince the guy planting it to either build a statue or plant some flowers instead, so when you go back to 2001 where you died, there won't be a tree for your assassin to hide behind and you'll live. It's an amusing concept. You can travel through time using a device in your pocket that Demon Mario gives you, so at almost any time you can just click on it in your inventory and travel to either the 1500s, the early 1900s, the 70s, or the current day of 2001. It's novel seeing the town evolve between eras, with roads and lights getting put in and buildings completely changing styles, and there's lots of swapping between day and night and snowing and not snowing and different color palettes, which helps bring variety to a game that's in entirely set within a few city blocks. You can see from a writing or development perspective how this could all easily spiral into an overwrought web of branching paths and endless possibilities even while being limited to a small town with only a handful of characters, and there is a lot of branching paths and butterfly effect stuff that we'll touch on, but generally there's only one way to stop yourself from dying, and you'll need to find that specific way. You can also easily see how finding that solution could have that classic adventure game problem where you just get stuck banging your head against a wall with too little 
additional information, but there's always very clear hints on what you need to do and where you need to go. The game will straight up tell you sometimes that you need to time travel somewhere, and our protagonist Ike thinks aloud all the time about what he needs to do next. He'll also write hints in his diary, because of course he has a diary, and you can visit a fortune teller if you really need extra help. There's definitely no need to consult a walkthrough, and the guidance does slow down a bit towards the end to great effect, letting you figure out what you need to do using what you've learned throughout the game. So while Shadow of Memories might seem really complex, if you're being cynical you can boil it down to a game where you, at least when you first play it, just walk between cutscene triggers and occasionally use items when it's obvious you need to. And there's not a lot of gameplay at all really, you'll more often than not be watching long cutscenes, so there's certainly a reliance on the storytelling, and because this is such a story heavy game I will spoil some things, so fair warning. Despite all the time travel and Demon Mario and all this supernatural stuff, Shadow of Memories is actually a soberingly realistic game in a lot of other ways. Uh, aside from our young adult protagonist Ike and his long-legged time-traveling adventures, the characters in this town are all dealing with very human issues. Uh, take Eckhart, an art-loving, cat-loving friend of Ike's who runs a museum. A bit into the game, you time travel back to the 70s and bump into a younger, ecstatic Eckhart who just found out he's going to have a daughter with his wife. Wife. So you return to the present and ask him about it, and it clearly upsets him as he explains that his wife was killed and his daughter was taken in an attack. And then a lot later on in the game, you turn up to the scene of the crime on the day of the attack in 1980, making you the main suspect. Uh, back in the present day and towards the end of the game, clouded by being blackmailed with the allure of getting his daughter back, Eckhart betrays and attempts to kill Ike, with part of him in his irrational frenzy antagonizing Ike simply because he looks like the guy at the crime scene over 20 years earlier, which of course the logical side of Eckhart knows is impossible, even if it's actually true. And this is a a very human response. Eckhart's held onto this grief all this time. He clearly harbors a lot of anger and guilt that he can't help but direct somewhere, and after it's piece by piece built up to us what's happened in his past, when it hits this crescendo you empathize with why it all went down the way it did, even if Ike in classic Ike fashion seems fairly nonchalant about it all. There's a duality here with another character who lost their mother which also feels very grounded, and both stories are excellently paced where they offhandedly plant the hints of each narrative thread early, and then use the time travel framework to reveal more and more information in a non-linear way. There's a natural heightening in stakes and drama that wouldn't otherwise work if these stories were told in chronological order. Other characters don't have quite as dramatic stories to tell, but they're still very human. A middle-aged man facing career regret, a young daughter not wanting her parents to sell the family home, a waitress feeling like no one would care if she just disappeared one day. There's a clear focus on portraying the human condition in an otherwise very fantastical game, and if you click with it, or if you can look past the bad acting, offbeat dialogue and sheer strangeness, it's hard not to immerse yourself in the sentimentality of it all. But I'm always the one running these kinds of errands. I feel so tired. The way the interiors in the game are meticulously modelled to look lived in and realistic is an extension of that attempt to portray day-to-day -day realism. Like, you'll see paintings on walls and kitchen appliances on bench tops and random stuff on top of wardrobes. It, it doesn't sound like much, but it's the same sort of carefully designed effect you would get from walking into a room in a Shenmue game or a Yakuza game. And Buildings are often planned out like buildings rather than video game levels, letting you walk into bathrooms and kitchens and living rooms for no other reason than to further lull you into this portrayal of everyday life. A portrayal that's again obscured by some real B-movie elements. Another thing Shadow of Memories is excellent at is paying off setups, and disguising setups so well that you don't even realise that they're leading anywhere. Like going back to Eckhart's museum, you end up actually meeting one of the artists whose paintings are in the museum when you go back to the 1500s, and you can tell him to paint different things which will then appear in the museum hundreds of years later. And not only do you make your way through Eckhart's personal history, you also go through his family history and meet his great grandfather who's amusingly basically the same character model with a moustache, and you discover how the museum started and why the family has a connection to that artist, and you can change the future by turning the museum into a library instead. Plus you even meet a bunch of descendants of that artist. It's, it's, a, it's a fun way of world building as you sort of 
flash through and build up people's lives and histories. Even smaller things like running into an old man jogging in 2001 and then running into his younger self jogging in the 70s or running into the owner of the local pub or cafe in both of those time periods or seeing how the local pub evolved over the years from an outdoor stand into a full blown bistro or running into minor characters ancestors, it virtually always pays off to pay attention to the small things in Shadow of Memories. Even if it only pays off in the smallest ways, it all still feels very thoughtful and gratifying. Partly because of this though, the early parts of the game feel really slow the first time you play it. It seems like the game is throwing completely random information at you for no reason and it's easy to dismiss it as random because the game itself is otherwise so quirky and because Ike is just a weird nosy character but when all the callbacks start happening it all starts paying off as the narratives build on top of each other. It's consistent and paced well enough that it creates this effect where you're constantly connecting dots and thinking about why things are the way they are, like why Eckhart has so many cats, or why he got angry at Ike in particular mentioning his daughter, or why the painter painted certain things. By the time you reach the final chapter, you're so invested in this web of story threads that when they inevitably raise the stakes by getting a bit more supernatural again, it really lands. Even though it's quite schlocky, after you've spent hours involving yourself and finding reasons to care about this weird town and its mostly very normal people, when they come under threat in some way, it has a real emotional weight to it and suddenly the time limits really matter. When a character tells you that you have 20 minutes to do something or something bad will happen, I'm doing my best not to be too detailed here because I don't want to spoil anything more about the ending. Uh, that 20 minutes, which basically ticks by in real time, is very tense, especially because the game does a lot with branching paths. You feel like things will actually go wrong if you fail. There are eight different endings in the game and it's made obvious which dialogue choices will dictate which ending you get. I've replayed the game and loaded saves a few times to get some of the different endings and each one usually only reveals bits and pieces of the game's many mysteries so it invites you to replay and try different things to truly understand everything. Each chapter has a percentage completed meter and I was really surprised to see just how much of the game I'd missed on my first playthrough. By following the obvious clues and guidance, you won't actually see half of the cutscenes in the game and it's when you step away, experiment and replay a bit where the game reveals just how much variance there actually is. Chapter 4 opens with Ike getting stabbed in the back and dying. No surprises there, and you spend the rest of the chapter finding a way to tell yourself from the past to find a frying pan to hide under your jacket for when you get stabbed. Uh, Ike dies if he directly communicates with himself, so you end up dressing as a juggling street performer and throwing past Ike a message to get a pan, and when you do that, suddenly you have a pan in your inventory. Uh, don't think too hard about it, of course there are paradoxes everywhere. Back in chapter 1, you actually see this juggling street performer, and if you go off the beaten path and talk to them later in the game, he'll throw you that message to find a frying pan. Of course, if you do this in your first playthrough, you'll have absolutely no idea what's going on, but if you do know what's going on and you manage to find a frying pan, then once you reach chapter 4, you can use the frying pan to avoid being stabbed at the very start, and that will end the entire chapter in under a minute. It is amazing, and it's a great way of rewarding you for replaying and experimenting with the game. There's lots of neat little things like this and there's lots of missable dialogue to get by just wandering around and time traveling to different eras and different chapters and if you die and come back that can also change scenes and dialogue where Ike will talk to people in a different way because he knows what's going to happen. With all this and the dialogue options and the story changing to accommodate different endings it's a deceptively vast game. I do wish there were more solutions to the puzzles but there are at least different ways to reach those solutions. The problem with it all is you're always on a strict time limit, so at least on your first playthrough there's zero reason to want to explore and even on subsequent playthroughs it's annoying dying to time when you're just sort of wandering around poking at things trying to see ways you can change the game. And when you do die one of two things happens. You either go to a purgatory like area where Demon Mario revives you and throws you back into the real world which is fine, or you get a game over and get thrown back out to the main menu where you need to load a save 
save file, and you can only load a save file at the start of each chapter, so you'll need to restart the entire chapter. It's unpredictable which one you'll get when you die. You aren't able to skip cutscenes that you haven't seen, so if you're on your second playthrough of the game, you can skip all the cutscenes that you saw on your first playthrough, which is a great quality of life thing, but if you died and got thrown out to the menu on your first playthrough, which almost certainly will happen, you can't skip any of the cutscenes that you just saw before you died, which might not sound like a big deal, but for a slower paced game with hours of cutscenes and a game that encourages you to die sometimes to see different endings, when you die and get punished like this, it is very annoying. And there are some shorter cutscenes that you can simply never skip upon replaying the game, which is also a shame. There's also a fair few eyebrow raising parts of the writing that just don't really work. Like there's a character from the modern day who spends a few years in the 16th century and decides that she likes it more there, I guess, and wants to stay there, which just seems unrealistically optimistic. Uh, you can get a statue built of yourself, but no one will ever acknowledge that it's you. Uh, characters put way too much trust into Ike for no valid reason, and Ike is way too forgiving of characters that try to kill him. There's, there's a lot of writing blemishes like this that you'll just need to look the other way with. And there's definitely a certain amount of buy-in and looking the other way with every other eccentricity in Shadow of Memories. You'll have to have a taste for the more schlocky elements of the story and not be bothered by the endless time paradoxes and the slow start and the bad dialogue and the weird long-winded cutscenes and the heavy-handedness of the hints and the bad camera controls and the now very dated graphics. It's, it's, it's a game that comes with a lot of caveats that not everyone will be able to look past. And that's okay, but if you can, Shadow of Memories is a game where you'll get out what you put in. If you want an easy to get through three to four hour, well-constructed, cheesy time travel adventure with early PS2 graphics, a lot of heart, and a lot of satisfying setups and payoffs, then that's exactly what you'll get with this. But if you're the patient type and you want to spend 15 hours picking it apart to try to find the different ways you can play the game and uncover the many mysteries behind every major character, including Ike himself, then this is a very rewarding game for you too. And it's a concept that I think could be revisited, like time traveling through a small town and learning the history of all the characters and impacting everything that happens. There are places I think Shadow of Memories could have taken its ideas further, and though time travel stories do feel a bit done to death, that's not the case so much in video games, so this still feels fresh and unique, and it'd be fun to see a spiritual successor to it in some way. In fact, there apparently is one. Uh, Junko Kawano directed, wrote, designed, and apparently voiced the cats in Shadow of Memories. It was very much her project, and while she's most well known for the Suikoden games, she did make a game in 2007 for the DS called Time Hollow, where you travel through time to find your missing parents. After playing this, I'll definitely be checking that out sometime. For now, I'm not done with Shadow of Memories. There's still more endings I want to unlock, there's more backstories I want to understand, and down the track, I think I'll look back on my time in this funny little polygonal German town with a certain sense of goofy and affectionate sentimentality. And there we wrap up the video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did and you want to support the channel, you can like and subscribe and comment and blah, blah, blah. Go to Patreon if you like. That's probably the best way of supporting. Um, I should mention that the game Shadow of Memories was also ported to Xbox. Uh, around a year, a year and a half after it, after it first came out. It was also ported to PC around that time. And then years and years later in 2009, it came out on PSP. So there are other ways to play it. Uh, I think the PS2 version is generally considered to be the best version. Um, and the Windows version is considered to be the worst version. But otherwise, I don't think you can really uh, go too wrong. I want to thank uh, the person in my Discord server who annoyed me so often to play this game that I ended up playing it and really liking it. So <laughs> thank you to you and thank you to my patrons. At the end of the video, I do this little outro bit to specifically thank my patrons. So thank you to my patrons. Thank you to all the patrons coming up on the screen and a special thank you to my $5 patrons. Alex Austin, Analog Man, Anthony Gallagher, Anthony Valiant, Aradina Varen, Big J, Boggy Online, uh, Bry, Cannondorf, CD Rom Fossil, Chu Cannon, Connor Salinas, Dan Pierce, Daniel Gold, Devin Grandal, Dingo Dangle, Dominic Chikoki, Doe Pants, Down the Cat Hole, Evil Chicken, Felipe Megales, uh, Gary Pay, 
Hazardous, Kirby, Ian Lockhart, Jay Goulds, Jenny McGlynn, Kane Ramsey, Kayla, Labcat, Lucas Ray Sevick, uh, Major1940, May Arise, Mazaki, Melanie G, Michael Brennan, Minimi's use of the word embiggens is perfectly cromulent. Uh, Mr. Sunday Movies, Mustache, Duct Tape, Oscar, PK Punky Kong, Patrick Kirst, Peter Soros, Puix, Plague, Riddlin' for Kids, Robbie Grieg, Ruth Knappman, Sam King, Sam Liss, Scott Hazlitt, Sky Panthera, Spoofer, Tio, Test Drive Unlimited 2, The Dan Marty, The Last Great Opium Den, Tix, Trevor Corbin, Trixie Emerson, Wastelander 997, Wayne Larkin, and Zindictive. Thank you all for supporting the channel as usual. And uh, yeah, see you all next time. Bye.